It is December 1907 in the coal fields of southwestern Pennsylvania. A 16-year-old boy by the name of Joe Sharpenberg is one of 400 employed at the Dar Mine. This day, he has managed to get the day off, and he and his older brother Frank are up in the hillside looking for a pine tree to cut down. They pick the best tree they can find, haul it down the hillside, and stash it in their shed in the back of their property. This tree is going to be used in a couple weeks for the family Christmas tree. Joe does not know it, but he will be in the epicenter of one of the worst mining disasters in American history. This is the story of the Dar Mine Disaster. The typical layout of operations at the Dar Mine in December 1907 consisted of the two towns of Van Meter and Jacobs Creek, Pennsylvania. They were divided by the Yakagani River. Now the Dar Mine is on the Van Meter side, the western side of the Yakagani. But in 1907, only the uh, top bosses and top workers of the Dar Mine lived in Van Meter. Van Meter was also the home of the company store and mine offices. These were located in such a position that from the mine office, the bosses can look at the manways going into the mountainside. So you can keep track of everything going in and out. But most of the people working in the mine lived across the river in Jacobs Creek on the eastern side of the river. There were about 400 men employed at the Dar Mine in December 1907, and they came from a variety of backgrounds predominantly immigrants from Italy and Hungary, but there were immigrants from all parts of Europe, as well as all types of Americans, predominantly locals, living in western Pennsylvania. Now, the interesting thing about this mining operation is that there was no major bridge connecting Jacobs Creek to Van Meter. Uh, my personal belief is that the Yakagani River was just too wide at this point. The only way of transportation from Jacobs Creek to Van Meter was the cable ferry, a cable car that went across the Yakagani River. It took a fee of a nickel. Hey, it's the company. I guess they're going to try to get, you're going to have to pay just a transport to get your way to work on an average day. The mine opened in the 1850s when the Osborne and Sauger Coal Company began digging into the mountainside near Van Meter, Pennsylvania. This mine will become known as the Dar Mine. The mine would eventually expand to be one of the largest in southwestern Pennsylvania and one of the most profitable. By 1901, the Pittsburgh Coal Company had established their own mines on this side of the Okagany River. They were known as the Banning Mines. However, they wanted the lucrative Dar Mine and eventually purchased it in 1903. The Dar Mine by 1907, from the pit mouth to its very end, measured over 10,000 feet in length. And that's not counting all the side shafts running left and right. This meant that all air for the mine was entering through the either the main entrance or through the manways. Ventilation shafts were needed above ground with huge fans to pull the air through the mine, up through shafts, and then exhaust it back out on the surface in a horseshoe manner. This initially worked just fine when the mine was open in the 1850s, but it expanded far too big for the one fan house located near the pit mouth. Now, ventilation in a coal mine is top priority for obvious reasons. You need to breathe while you're mining, but there are some other needs for it as well. You need to be pulling that air continually through and out of the mine, a continued circulation to pull any coal dust that's caught up in the air and pulled to the surface, as well as trying to keep natural gases from seeping in from the walls and taking up residence in the corridors of the mines. So the circulation keeps the natural gases and the coal dust continually moving in and out of the mine, limiting the risk of an explosion. In 1902, the United States began adopting the carbide lamp for use in mining operations. This is to replace the older, more common used oil wick lamp. This goes to all the way back to the beginning of mining. The issue with the oil wick lamp is, as it says, it is a wick of uh, wick dampened in oil with an open flame that has no control on it. The carbide, while it is also an open flame, can be controlled by using the various dials on the lamp. The problem is in 1907, the Dar Mine had yet to update to these newer carbide lamps. It was much more cheaper to have miners keep using the old oil lamps. In late summer 1907, the Dar Mine hired William Campbell to be one of the newest foremans. 
Campbell did not like what he saw in the mine. He described a region of the mine at the very rear portions of the newest digging sites as the swamp. Here, air was stagnant. There was no circulation, oxygen, coal dust, natural gases were all left stagnant. It was very dry, it was hard to breathe, and this is the imminent sign of an explosion waiting to happen. Campbell continually pestered the Pittsburgh Coal Company that a new ventilation shaft had to be dug and dug urgently. The company kept pushing it off until around December of 1907, when it gets a little sketchy, but from some of the reports, it sounds like that the company had approved the digging of a new ventilation shaft, and that new digging would begin on December 20th, 1907. Unfortunately, it would be a day too late. December 19th, 1907 opened mostly normal for the Dar Mine. For the past two days, the Dar Mine had been closed due to Greek Orthodox miners refusing to work as the Feast of St. Nicholas approached. The Dar Mine was not going to wait for a third day, however, reopened and hired miners from the now closed Naomi Mine, which was just eight miles to the west of Van Meter, Pennsylvania. On December 1st, 1907, an explosion had killed 34 miners and shut down the Naomi Mine. These miners out of work did not hesitate to work in the Dar Mine. The morning went on mostly normal. Miners came over in teams of six across the cable car from Jacobs Creek to Van Meter. You'd have to take a little walk down the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie railroad tracks and then take a bridge that went over the yard. Van Meter was primarily the residence, not of the Dar mine workers, but of workers of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad. They lived on the Yakagini River side of Van Meter, and then the Bosser's Row and company store for the Dar mine was on the western side of the track. So you had to cross this bridge over the tracks, go to the company store, get all of your things you needed, go to the company offices, clock in, put your tag on the board, and head down through the manways into the mines. Now, at the time of December 19th, most of the mining was occurring, in fact, two miles deep into the mine. It was nowhere near Van Meter at the time. And this is where calamity struck. Concerned this segment of PA Route 51 at 11.30 a.m. on December 19th, 1907, the worst mine disaster in Pennsylvania began with a fierce explosion. In a chain reaction, every little particle of du uh, coal dust was set aflame. It was like a lightning bolt shot through the mine. A chain explosion it went two miles from the end to the pit mouth. At the pit mouth, and it, just as the tenth load of coal was brought out for the day onto the tipple, a plume of black smoke exploded out of the pit mouth. The ground shook. Glass in the nearby buildings shattered. The explosion could be felt for over eight miles. Immediately after the explosion, a crowd of people rushed to the pit mouth. Smoke was still coming out of the mine. Fruit of smoke emerged. Thomas Williams. He'd been riding one of the car mines on the way out of the pit mouth when the explosion occurred. He had managed to got enough time to jump off into a siding, allowing that plume of smoke to fly past him. He then, got, being guided by the rail, got himself out of the mine. With Williams, the crowd was optimistic that more people had survived this explosion. However, they could only go so far into the pit mouth as the smoke was so thick and the fear of fire still raged inside the mine. Crowds instead tried to enter through the 21st entry, which came in through the mine from the north hillside, about a half a mile north of the pit mouth. Just inside, they found William Campbell, the foreman, who had been warning about the ventilation issues, dead, along with four other bodies. One of the bodies was decapitated. This indicated to the people of Jacobs Creek and Van Meter that there probably was not going to be a rescue effort. This was going to be a recovery effort. That recovery effort would have to wait until December 20th when a company and state officials could arrive on the scene. Along with them came the press from Pittsburgh. In the news for the past couple of weeks were reports of the Monongah mine explosion at mines number six and eight in Monongah, West Virginia. This had been one of the worst mining disasters and would go on to be the deadliest mine disaster in American history. 
The bodies were still being counted in West Virginia when the Dar mine had exploded, and the close proximity of the two mining disasters was not lost on the press. When re recovery efforts began, they would occur in teams of four, with 25 rescuers per team. Many of these rescuers were miners, but some of them were also just citizens volunteering their time and effort. Ahead of these four teams would have been an advanced party of more skilled rescuers, one of them being Luke Brett, who was an English miner that came to America and actually was in the region because he had just been part of the recovery efforts down the Bonanga mine. These six men would have been dressed in leather masks to protect themselves from the smoke and possible fire and all were equipped with oxygen tanks. They moved very slowly into the mine, being hampered by the heavy equipment they were carrying. The smoke, the chaos inside made it very difficult to figure out where you were. Fortunately, the most of the abutments that were holding up the roofs were intact. Unfortunately, the shock of the explosion had loosened the slate roof in areas where there was no support, and slate falls were frequent on the recovery crews as they made their way deeper and deeper into the mine. And you need to remember too, that this mine was over two miles in length from the pit mouth to the end. And most of the mining at the time the explosion was occurring at that end portion. So as they made their way forward past what were now abandoned alleyways that spurred off deep into the mine, they would have to slowly partition them off. Once again, for ventilation reasons, they were not going to ventilate parts of the abandoned exploded mine that did not need the air. By December 22nd, only a few dozen bodies had been recovered and the company were doing the numbers to try to figure out how many had been in the mine at the time of the explosion. An estimate was given at 160. So 160 caskets were made ready to be shipped to Van Meter. About the same time, about four rescuers became sick from black damp, areas in the mine where oxygen had been completely used up by the fire and the explosion. The slow progress of the recovery of bodies was weighing heavy on the minds of the women and children, many of them who had loved ones that were in the mine at the time of the explosion. Compounding matters was the press that was continually hounding these loved ones. The recovery was hampered by the fact that there was no really solid connection between Van Meter and Jacobs Creek, just a cable car. So any news they needed to come in and out of the re recovery efforts had to go across this very small cable car. There were no phone lines of very little electricity in Van Meter, Pennsylvania. There were phone lines, however, in Jacobs Creek along the Baltimore and Ohio rail line on the eastern side of the Yockagani River. This is why most accounts of the disaster inaccurately label it from Jacobs Creek, not Van Meter. To make matters even more worse, state police was brought in to try to control the crowd of sightseers. People were boarding the trains uh, of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie in the Baltimore, Ohio by the hundreds from Pittsburgh and from Connorsville trying to get a glimpse of this horrific mine disaster. They had to bring the police in to control these crowds, but the police became under conflict with the townspeople of Van Meter and Jacobs Creek who really were losing were at their wit's end with no signs of bodies being recovered. There were several cases of violence breaking out between the police and wives of deceased minors, and there were cases also of fighting between drunken men. People were going to the bars, drinking heavily immediately after the disaster, and in fact, the uh, what, uh, bars in that part of Westmore County had to be closed for a, a certain amount of time after the disaster. On Christmas Eve, 1907, one of the big pockets of bodies was uncovered inside the mine. Now, initially, the bodies were found to be so burned and mauled as they were making way through the main alleyway. But the pretty interesting is that most of the bodies recovered near the site of the explosion were not singed or destroyed. It was more from the suffocation is what these miners probably had died from. The grim task of identifying the remains was made farther difficult by the lack of resources at Van Meter, PA. Initially, the, a temporary morgue was set up just outside the pit mouth at a blacksmith shop, but eventually a large tent was brought that could house a hundred human remains, allowing loved ones to come inside and identify, if they could, identify some of these remains. Many of the bodies, however, were scorched black by the fire. Some of them were dismembered, some had their eyeballs completely blown out of their skulls. 
it was a very difficult process for these loved ones to try to identify some of these remains. Once, once a remain would be identified, it would be put in a plain casket paid for by the Pittsburgh Coal Company. On top of the casket, once the lid was tacked on, would have been the name of the victim if they were identified and their death certificate. They then would place the caskets along the platform at the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie or the Baltimore and Ohio stations on either side of the river, awaiting to be transported off to cemeteries chosen by their loved ones. About a dozen of the Hungarian victims of the mine disaster were sent to Connorsville, Pennsylvania to be buried in St. Emery's Cemetery. Eventually, the mass grave at All Branch Baptist Church would come to include 71 remains of victims of the Dar mine disaster, 44 of them being unidentified. Bulk of the recovery effort was finished by New Year's 1908, but bodies would continue to be located inside the mine until February of 1908. What is astonishing about this disaster is that it could have been far worse. As I had mentioned earlier in the video, at least 100 miners, maybe even 200 miners of the Greek Orthodox faith refused to work on December 19th because per the Julian calendar, which some Catholic churches were still following at this point, that was actually St. Nicholas Day. St. Nicholas Day for the Gregorian calendar, which we all follow today, is on December 6th. How the Greek Orthodox faith got to da the Dar Mine is that many Karpovrusians had been assimilated over the years into the Hungarian Catholic culture and been pushed out of their native lands. That is what led to immigration of many of these Karpovrusians uh, from Hungary into America and found work as miners in southwestern Pennsylvania. The Greek Orthodox miners of the Dharman could not afford in 1907 their own church. They did not even have their own priest. In fact, they hired a reverend father from nearby Lysenring, Pennsylvania to lead them into the celebrations of St. Nicholas Day on the 19th. And about 200 people were packed in a Protestant building the Greek Orthodox miners were renting that day when they felt the explosion across the river. It would not be until the final death toll was tallied that people found discrepancies in a lack of deaths of the Carpo Russians working in the Dar Mine because, like I said, they were across the river celebrating St. Nicholas Day. This soon became declared a miracle of St. Nicholas. And in 1911 and 1913, the Greek Orthodox miners raised enough funds to establish two churches, one on either side of the river. One was established in Periopolis, PA, which to this day is on the National Registry of Historic Places, and another was established in Jacobs Creek. And though the uh, church in Jacobs Creek has caught fire and burned and been for many hardships over the years, it is still standing to this day. In total, the Dar Mine would go on to claim the, officially the lives of 239 miners. This would be the deadliest mining disaster in Pennsylvania history. And per the records today, it is still one of the deadliest mine disasters overall in American history. Several of the miners were of younger age. The youngest recorded death I could find was at the age of 13 which was illegal technically for somebody that age should be working in the mines. Again, technically it's 1907, you know, the coal companies are getting away with everything and every turn a blind eye. One of the younger de uh, casualties was Joseph Sh Sharpenberg. On December 21st, 1907, Frank and a, another brother of theirs identified Joseph's body in the morgue tent in Van Meter, carried him across on the ferry cable car to Jacobs Creek where his remains were put in the living room of their house. The Christmas tree outside in the shed wilted for the remainder of the holiday season. Joseph is now buried in a family plot in West Newton Cemetery. Hearings and investigations went on through January and February of 1908. The official report was that the cause of the explosion was squarely on a miner who had walked into a partitioned off area of the mine, thus accidentally ignited an explosion. The company had their hands wiped clean of any blame officially. Many miners, over had, however, had a different opinion. Today, many historians are pointing to the lack of ventilation in the mine for being the contributing cause of the explosion. 
the Pittsburgh Coal Company knew their mine was too big for one ventilation shaft, but for whatever reason, did not upgrade. In fact, in 1906, a survey was done of all the mines in that section of Pennsylvania, including the Dar Mine, and the official report states, Ventilation not satisfactory at the time of my last visit, but they had 10 men at work enlarging and straightening airways. Whatever straightening and enlarging occurred, it was not adequate enough. In 1915, the Bureau of Mines would approve of the electric headlamp. By the 1930s, all open flame lamps had been all but abandoned in the mines. The electric lamp was the way of mining, which is still used to this day. Very little remains of the shrinking villages of Van Meter and Jacobs Creek. Even less remains of the industries that dominated both sides of the river. A little bit of rubble in the woods marks the landing of the Cable Ferry. Concrete foundations peek out of the hillside along a windy one-lane road. The pit mouth is entirely buried to prevent people from climbing into the mine and risking their lives. The Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, which carried many of the victims to their final resting places, is now a bike trail. At the foot of the hill, there lies a simple yet impactful marker, briefly explaining what transpired here over a hundred years ago. Nothing along Route 51 designates the calamity that occurred 140 feet below. But if one drives through to sleepy town of Smipton, making their way along State Route 981, you will come upon the Olive Branch Baptist Church. Here a blue state marker explains its significance of a lump of rock that sits in a clearing in the graveyard. Here lay 71 martyrs of the Dar Mine Disaster, December 19th, 1907.